Welcome to this episode of Talk is Biotech. My name is Guru Singh. I'm the CEO of SciSpot.io and today's host. And we have an inspiring bio entrepreneur from the province of Alberta. Today, he's the CEO of Outbreaker Solution. His name is Matt Hodgson. And welcome to the show, Matt. How are you? Good, Guru. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on Talk is Biotech. Do you want to start with a quick introduction? Who you are, what you do? Sure. So I'm co-founder of Outbreaker Solutions, and we're a local biotech company in Edmonton, Alberta. And we've been researching and developing our patented antimicrobial touch surface. What makes our surface really unique is that it's made from compressed salt. So the Mm -hmm. same salt that you sprinkle on your food, uh, we compress it, and then it forms a hard, durable, almost like a ceramic type surface. And then we integrate those with commonly touched items, such as you know door handles, touch plates, railings, and other similar fixtures like that. Mm-hmm. And that becomes the touch point because what we are investigating and what we've proven is just how fast acting salt is at killing all sorts of microorganisms. Great data on killing bacteria to the tune of 99.9% in just two minutes, as well as fungi. And we have a research partnership with the University of Alberta, where we're exploring viruses as well, including SARS-CoV-2. Very cool. So let's take a few steps back and uh, introduce your company. How would you give a quick intro of your company? Is it a product company, service company you work with, other producers, and add this additional productive layer? So how would you describe your company? Yeah, so we're, we're a product-focused company. So what we're exploring, not only the research behind the actual efficacy and the science behind how compressed salt works to kill microorganisms, but also on the physical integration of salt with other commonly touched surfaces. So we're exploring a couple different avenues. First is actually building touch surfaces out of compressed salt. This here is just like a little lever cylinder and it's made of regular salt with some coloring agents in that. So that's just an example of you can actually form an entire shape up. So part of it is actually uh, building these products and then getting them integrated with things you're gonna touch and grab. And then the other part is researching additional ways to integrate sodium chloride into other surfaces that you're gonna come in contact with because our data shows just how strong that sodium chloride is at killing all sorts of microorganisms. So how, how does it work? So you uh, sell this to consumers or do you sell it to businesses and even uh, work with them collaboratively to think about the aesthetic piece? Because if I add this additional layer of the sodium chloride, compressed sodium chloride, I want to make sure it doesn't um, interfere with the design of that. So how, what's the business model? How does it work? Yeah. So of course the design and the aesthetics behind it is a really important piece. And that's largely what we're working on right now. So we're in the process of completing some of this research and submitting our efficacy to the regulators in order to use human health claims. So uh, although it's just regular salt uh, inspired from animal salt licks for horses and cows, uh, we still have that regulatory hurdle to get over, which is uh, Mm -hmm. the ability to use these human health related claims, uh, which is it's good that this is regulated so people can't start just selling a product, claiming it kills bacteria without actually doing so. Mm -hmm. Um, So as of now, we don't have products available for sale yet because first we wanna get that regulatory approval in place. Um, For the actual product itself, it's a mix of that actual physical touch plate is what we're actually piloting right now in partnership uh, with Edmonton Transit uh, here in Edmonton where where I am Um, and then what we want to do is partner with a lot of companies that are manufacturing these fixtures and touch pieces. Uh, We want to be able to provide this as a layer of protection for those coming in contact with things like handles and railings and and push plates and those sorts of things. That's pretty cool. So like door knobs and uh, hospital beds. So are you thinking uh, that as your potential collaborator, these producers of door knobs or hospital beds. Exactly, exactly right. Those are kind of the, the, the key kind of first areas we're looking at because 
that's such a, a high touch point, right? They're in our home or, or office. Hopefully once we can all get back into the offices, you know, we're, we're still touching all sorts of things that everybody's touching. So that's kind of where we want to go after first. But of course, our technology isn't limited to any kind of one specific use or one type of surface. So we really have a huge amount of possibilities ahead of us and just focusing right now initially on things like door handles and touch surfaces like that. Very cool. Do you have any efficacy data compared to, let's say, copper? So uh, It's more of a traditional knowledge of Eastern countries, like copper has entire microbial uh, capabilities. So many hospitals are even installing uh, doorknobs and hospital beds uh, with copper coating. Do you have any efficacy data to compare with other um, alternatives? Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's this is one of our biggest uh, points of, of, of pride behind our product is uh, our efficacy against these other types of antimicrobial surfaces. So in all of our research, we actually go head to head, not only with a control, which we use stainless steel, just doesn't have any antimicrobial properties and our piece of, and we call it CSC or compressed sodium chloride. And we always, when possible, try to add a piece of antimicrobial copper. And then you complete the same experiment on our control, the, or our surface, excuse me, the control piece of stainless steel and then copper. And we achieve uh, the reduction 99.9% .9 in two minutes and copper to achieve that takes about two hours. So we are, you know, orders of magnitude faster acting than copper. And we actually see in our latest paper, we actually published one in January in scientific reports, and we included some, some visual representation of the product under our testing conditions to show colony forming units of bacteria and how rapidly they decline over time. And when I say time, I'm talking about, you know, one to two minutes. And even in the first five seconds, you can visually see how few bacteria remain on our CSC surface. Is mainly anti-bacteria or fungus or viruses as well? So the bulk of our research is on bacteria. And that was largely because prior to COVID, bacteria were kind of the big scary bug, especially hospital acquired infections and still pose a big threat. And not that we want to scare people, but bacteria haven't gone away, right? And so the bulk of our research is on bacteria. Also because just when it comes to the logistics of trying to get this research done, bacteria are relatively easy to test. Virus is really complicated. You pretty much have to be within a university, especially in Canada, to even test viruses. So okay. most of our research on bacteria initially, and then there was actually a group of researchers out of the University of Alberta a few years ago that were looking at sodium chloride and integrating that into like fabric for face masks. Mm -hmm. And they had shown that influenza virus was inactivated in five minutes using sodium chloride. So that became our first published piece of literature that showed how fast acting sodium chloride is at inactivating viruses. And then once COVID hit, our company won a grant from Roche Canada last year, mm -hmm. which allowed us to get some research underway at the University of Alberta, actually looking at the novel strain of the coronavirus. So that research, the first phases of that are complete now. And the researchers at the university are in the process of submitting our data to an academic journal. So although I really want to respect that process, so I can't disclose some of the research results just yet, but it's very exciting research. Obviously, we knew that a similar structured virus, like influenza in terms of an envelope virus, was inactivated quickly. So we had a good hypothesis going in that it would be effective. Very cool. Very cool. Do you want to talk a little bit about your uh, R&D activities or your science? What type of efficacy experiments you have conducted? How you conducted in collaboration with some university core labs or do you want to talk about your science a little bit? Like what is the real science behind the impact of a potential impact of CSCs, compressed uh, sodium chlorides? And uh, I would love to know more about the science behind it and uh, basis of your claims, basically. Yeah. So initially, this all started with an inventor in Edmonton by the name of Doug Olson. 
and he got the idea as i said you know a little bit earlier inspired from these animal blocks of salt mm -hmm. and he got thinking you know salt has been used for preserving meat and food for thousands of years right wonder what would happen if i took a piece of this compressed salt uh, and had it tested with, against bacteria so he actually went to just a third party contract lab in Edmonton and they did some initial testing on, on common bacteria like Salmonella and E. coli. And the results he got from that showed very surprising fast efficacy. We're talking 99% in just a couple of minutes after bacteria is placed on the surface. And that started, uh, you know, the process of slowly putting a company together. At that time began the initial patent applications. And then over the years, that can take a surprising amount of time for people who might not know just how long it can take to actually get a granted patent. Mm -hmm. And then my other co-founder, Brain Whitlock, uh, met Doug Olson one day and Doug just started describing, you know, this product of his and brain was really interested and we eventually formed a partnership out of it. I come from a more business background, brain just completing a PhD at the University of Alberta. So you had that science and research background. And part of what we wanted to do was really build up the research program behind it because, you know, we've known all along this type of product when you're dealing with bacteria, fungi, viruses, especially wanting to get into healthcare and prevent infections in that environment you need a lot of really good data, strong data and published data, mm -hmm. uh, both from the regulatory standpoint, but also in convincing those within healthcare that your product actually works. So that's been a, a really big focus of ours. So prior to 2018, we didn't even have our own lab space to actually conduct this research. We were using a third party lab to get it done. And then we got into the new University of Alberta Health Accelerator space that opened that year. And we've been able to conduct a lot of our own research. All the research that went into this paper that we got published at the first part of 2021 actually was conducted at the U of A Health Accelerator in downtown Edmonton, which is really cool for us. We're not university researchers ourselves, so we don't have the lab and the funding sources behind all that. So it's an interesting differentiates us a little bit from a lot of companies in biotech, especially early stage startups, not having the full university infrastructure to kind of assist that way. But the U of A Health Accelerator has been, has been great for us. So part of what we wanted to do was first expand the different types of bacteria to make sure this isn't just one type, like a gram positive or just a gram negative. So really, you know, expanded it to Staphylococcus aureus, Pseudomonas, of course, those E. coli, Salmonella, then the antibiotic resistant bacteria like MRSA, C. difficile, VRE, and the most consistent results imaginable all coming back, you know, 99% reduction in just a couple of minutes. And then it was actually the other researchers who were looking at salt in the surgical mask that really gave us the best visualization and representation for the mechanism of action of the salt, which was not definitively known. Of course, we know salt dehydrates, right? So we know water's being sucked out of the cells, uh, some potential for denaturing the proteins, actually physically altering the shape. Uh, but what this paper actually showed was a process called recrystallization. Mm -hmm. So what we see is typically, um, you know, a bacteria or something is encased in a tiny water droplet. And then what happens when it lands on our piece of salt like this, a tiny bit of salt dissolves when the water from that droplet come in contact with it. And then almost instantly dries and recrystallizes. And that salt recrystallizing rapidly physically destroys that pathogen. And this was observed using a technique called microscopy. So actually being able to visually see what was happening. So that's been a really neat element behind all this, where we're not killing these pathogens the same way drugs do, right? We're a physical destroying mechanism, uh, which, which keeps that efficacy really strong. So expanded that, we're able to get some fungi tested through the third party lab as well. And results again, coming back the same way. So our first academic publication came in 2016 in the fall. We'd done a pilot study where we actually published the data we have against MRSA in a head-to-head -head study with copper. 
We published that with a co-author from the University of Alberta Infectious Disease Department, Dr. Stephanie Smith. And that was a, that was a big point for, for our company because that was the first you know, peer-reviewed publication, right? This isn't just data we were claiming and then not letting anybody see it kind of thing. And then, of course, that virus paper I mentioned a couple of times, and then our latest publication that came out just earlier this year. So huge focus on the research behind it and trying to publish those and make them accessible. That's pretty cool. And what are your patent claims here? Because like we know, salt has antimicrobial property. So what is the real uh, patent claim that, uh, that is even basically patentable and protectable? Yeah, and that question we get all the time, people want to wonder, how, how did you patent salt, right? Like, how does that happen? And so our claim, of course, needing to be novel is the use of sodium chloride as an antimicrobial agent on hand contact devices. So it's, you know, not the broadest use of possible for salt, but actually salt in this form used for the purpose of killing microorganisms when you come in contact with a hand uh, contact device. Uh, so that, that, that narrows it down and that kind of shows where our focus is. It can be like a mobile electronic device. It can be uh, iPad, but it cannot be like a fabric or you cannot target fashion industry. Like you cannot target a mask or I don't know, gloves in the future. Is that right with this patent claim? Not necessarily. So the patent, of course, has a number of different specific claims that go into it. But broadly speaking, we're about eliminating the transmission from device to person. So device you know, can be categorized, of course, as something right. like a door lever, but hand-to-hand -hand contact can still happen via clothing, right? So we're still kind of in that realm. Very cool. And uh, you mentioned you used the lab space of accelerator and what is the current lab setting? Like, do you have your own lab experiment you are, you have to do on an ongoing basis? Yeah, so it, it's a full uh, wet laboratory. It's on the, the fourth floor of Enterprise Square. I mean, the University of Alberta owns that space and they had actually put a pretty substantial investment into bringing in all that equipment so companies in the accelerator can have access to it. So we have our own space within that, that laboratory. It gives us all of the ability to receive bacteria, keep them stored in a, in a very cold temperature, and then actually conduct the research by putting them on little pieces of salt like this incubating them and then measuring that reduction. So it's, it's, it's full out laboratory. Of course, as I mentioned, there are certain types of pathogens that we can't bring in just as a function of safety levels, but that's where we've been able to draw on support from, from collaborators like the University of Alberta for the virus work. Very interesting. Do you have any milestone that you can talk about? What type of data you're trying to generate? Obviously not confidential, but anything that you can share publicly? Any clear milestone, like you need uh, specific data to establish partnership with uh, different type of companies? So the, probably the biggest milestone that we're after is that, that first regulatory approval. The data we have now are, are good enough to support getting that regulatory claim. The difference comes when actually getting it in the exact form that the regulator wants to see, because of course they have a standardized process for good reason. So it's about adjusting to a protocol that the regulator uh, would like. And for us, we are focused on the U.S. as a first entry point. And mm -hmm. our type of product is actually regulated through the EPA, different from most life sciences companies who, of course, fall within the FDA. Mm -hmm. And that's because technically this product is, is considered a pesticide. Funny point that, you know, years ago, we wouldn't have assumed we'd call this a pesticide product. So for us, it's about trying to get that milestone. And one of the challenges that we have as a young biotech company is obviously trying to get a brand new product through the regulatory process. Although, you know, you've talked about copper, copper actually went through the regulatory process in Canada and the U.S. a few years ago, and they were the first antimicrobial touch surface to do that. But in the meantime, the regulator has implemented some different standards and some updated protocols that we now have to kind of go after and work through. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the biggest milestone for us it, it is kind of the, 
the thing that we need in order to really hit the market and start you know, offering this to the public and, and to potential partners. We earlier this year as well launched a, a pilot project with a push plate product made from compressed salt that we were able to pilot in partnership with Edmonton Transit here, here within the city. And that was also a big milestone for us because this is the first time that represented an institutional partner for testing it out in the real world. Right. And giving us some good information, not necessarily on the, the scientific front because we don't have that clinical trial barrier that most drugs do because again, we aren't, we aren't right. considered that. But it gives some good uh, information just about the logistics behind uh, getting a product like this produced and then installed and then monitored and then if you need to switch it out and all those sorts of questions that we know potential customers and potential partners would be interested in. Very cool, very cool. When I think about potential like go-to market strategy, medical device comes to my mind, right? Public transport comes to my mind, hospitals comes to my mind, and also fashion industry comes to my mind. Do you have any target, like lucrative partners that you consider as a potential sweet spot? Like what is your go-to market strategy? Let's say you have approval from EPA, you're good to go in the US market. Like who will be your ideal customer? Again, if it is confidential, I don't wanna know, but like, do you have any any potential sweet spot in mind? Yeah, so we have some some really cool conversations ongoing with a few potential partners, which, you know, because, uh, you know, we, we haven't announced anything, I won't, I won't name them. Um, but, you know, speaking a bit more generally, we wanna target those areas where uh, you're more susceptible to picking up a pathogen, obviously. So these areas where, you know, we, we aggregate as people. Uh, so you're thinking about like the office environment, uh, things like schools actually represent a pretty substantial market opportunity. Mm-hmm. And really we want to go after kind of those areas first. Healthcare, huge potential market. We know that's obviously a really important area, but there are uh, a few more barriers and hurdles to get in before you can get into healthcare, as well as a bit longer procurement cycles when you're talking about that sort of market. So trying to target, you know, whether it be, you know, constructing new builds where you're going to actually be implementing some of these fixtures for the first time, but also have these retrofit simple application where, you know, a single school or a school district can say, you know, we'd like to implement this for the next school year and, and be able to deliver that. And for us targeting, working with a number of different dis- distributors within these spaces. So the key one is like building facilities and maintenance because the types of fixtures and, and surfaces they're already working with and distributing products for. And then the cleaning and hygiene space is of course, another natural fit where yeah. uh, working with distributors in that space and those providing products because they're the go-to sources for trying to get, you know, a product in that can help disinfect or clean or keep sanitized these different work environments. Very cool. Very cool. We, we touched this uh, briefly on the aesthetic piece. So uh, what are you doing in terms of making sure when you apply your uh, CSC coating, I don't know if it's a coating or what would you call it, it doesn't uh, interfere with the design of whether it's a utensil or surface or any product. So like wh- what type of R&D work or um, uh, things you have to do to, or are, are you even thinking about that, like aesthetic piece? Yeah, the, the aesthetics are really important. And that's one of the very early pieces of feedback we got uh, with some of our uh, earliest stage prototypes. And uh, because this is, you know, it's a physical object, people are gonna see it and they're gonna interact with it. Right. Because- want it to seamlessly fit within uh, whatever environment they have. Um, we have the ability to actually make this pretty much any color. So that's one of the great benefits is we can use even food grade coloring agents uh, to, to really manipulate how it appears visually. So for right. instance, we can have you know, a white piece of salt, but you can also have it a, a gray or a silver to look like a stainless steel piece, which is really interesting. And then in terms of the physical size and shapes and details, um, part of what we've been doing is exploring different ways to manufacture this. So 
typically the, the main way that these big animal blocks were made and that we've followed a little bit in the past is just compression. It's just pressure that actually forces the salt together and then you're left with this simple shape. But we've actually know of a few different ways that we can manufacture this and manipulate some of these other variables. And when you say you can color it like by using natural dyes, paint, and it doesn't interfere with uh, efficacy of salt? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So not paint necessarily, but like food coloring or a food coloring agent. And when we look at the salt content, when we color it, it's still 99 point, you know, five or 99.95 percent salt. So the weight of the uh, when included is is so small that you're not taking away any of that antimicrobial efficacy. And of course, with all our different colors that we've worked with, both from the animal salt block side and then the products we produce ourselves, the results again, that lovely piece of consistency when we get the right. test back. Right. And when we talk about salt coating, one question comes to my mind is, what is the shelf life? Like, is it only like once you do coating, um, if, if I do coating today, do I have to do coating every month? have to do like do you have like I don't know how would you even coat it like by spray or like I would love to know like what's a, like a typical maintenance if let's say it's widely adopted at every uh, train stations so like do they have to get uh, extra layer of uh, like coating every month every year every six months so that's one of the challenges we see with a lot of current products that are on the market for antimicrobials is if it is a spray, you typically have to reapply it yeah, once a month or more frequently um, as it wears down really fast. So uh, although a type of coating application uh, is a possibility for using salt like, like we have, that hasn't been our focus yet. So we've been on the, that actual physical product um, and then manufacturing it so it's part of that touch point. Uh, right. And you can manipulate how thick the product is. This is just as our little test pieces that we use in the lab. Of course, this is you know um, half a centimeter thick, and other pieces like this, obviously a little a little thicker, closer to a centimeter. And what we found is the product in that form lasts a really long time, so it wears down very very slowly, which is one of those uh, other differentiators from from products. And that's really important because we know in the field of infection prevention and control, anytime you have to add that human variable for mm -hmm. requiring a, an action, the long-term results just go down, right? So anytime somebody just washing our hands, you know, again, prior to COVID, especially no one washed their hands, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a bit facetious with that, but that's a huge problem because it requires an action on you. So we don't actually want to get into the space where you have a product that needs to be switched out constantly because we know that's going to lead to less compliance with actually preventing the pathogens from transferring on the device. So we can play around with the thickness uh, to make it last for different amounts of time. But in the current form that we have, just even as, you know, a little bit of a centimeter, it lasts a, a very long time, years uh, worth of, of longevity out of the product. Got it. Yeah, I think uh, especially if you target healthcare space, which has obviously extra layer of compliance, I'm pretty sure there there will be some requirement that every one year there is inspection or every two years and it requires, I don't know, replacement if you are not in the coating business. Yeah, well, exactly. And that's actually one of the, the, the different features of the regulatory process now is a bit more of the durability aspect, which they're integrating as part of that for the reason you mentioned, right? Like you can't claim that something works and then a week after you put it on, it's right. disappeared and it's not working any longer. So that's, that's an important piece. And, you know, even broadly speaking, like within healthcare, I was having a conversation a couple of weeks ago with folks in the door hardware space. They gave it an interesting insight, which was they're starting to see a little bit of talk and shifts in the broader adoption of antimicrobial additives and things within new buildings, thinking specifically places like long-term care centers, which of course mm -hmm. were hit very hard with, with COVID. So 
we know we're early in this sector. So even within life sciences and biotech, the antimicrobial surface space is just, it's brand new, right? And we're, we want to become that standard and really grow in the industry and raise the bar for the efficacy and just how well these products work. Right, right. I think the whole touchless industry is basically the competitor, not in the right direction for your business, right? So if there's no touch involved, no surface protection is needed. Exactly, exactly. And that's, you know, one of the areas we're seeing, yeah, a lot of, especially in the, in the door hardware space, we're seeing, you know, a move to touchless in those bigger environments. But of course, the way I like to look at it is, you know, that big, beautiful, new, sexy building that just got built might have uh, touchless features when you, when you enter it. But then there's the other 10,000 buildings that still have the old handle that you got to grab everywhere you go. So, you know, we can look at it um, from providing a layer of protection in these existing buildings with a retrofit type angle. And then, of course, still have things that you need to touch when you're inside them. And that's where, you know, we're thinking years ahead in terms of product possibilities where there are different use cases for how a fast acting antimicrobial could be really helpful that don't even have to do with the traditional touch a door hardware kind of kind of thing. Love it. Love it. I do see massive potential of something really simple, right? Solved, but if you can get a like exclusive rights, if you can get exclusive rights on it, even for 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, yeah. And salt is really interesting that way because it, everyone knows what it is. Everyone uses it. Everyone understands it. And especially in biotech, that isn't often the case. We're kind of the exception to the rule in terms of a technology that, you know, everyone has heard of and can understand. And that's, opened up additional kind of market possibilities too, because you have folks that are on the, you know, very health focused from a natural product standpoint who are very interested in this. And then you have, of course, companies that are hyper-focused on health hygiene sanitation from even a chemical compound standpoint, also interested because the efficacy is there and it's, it's efficacy numbers are rivaling these standard disinfectant cleaners. Right. Uh, I even think uh, you can consider creating some fusion or hybrid product, not just salt, but combine it with other natural antimicrobial agent. And then that's how you can even extend their defendability. You can defend it for a longer term. And maybe hopefully the mixture that you choose with salt also increases the efficacy. So no, I, I can see it going in many different direction as an entrepreneur. Obviously, if you hear a new idea, 10 ideas come to your mind. So I, I, I love it. Something really simple and impactful with a huge business potential. Love what you're doing. I want to hear your thoughts on your whole entrepreneurial journey. How you ended up as you're the CEO, right? Yep how you ended up as the CEO of Outbreaker Solution and what were the challenges? What were the barrier to entry? Even you have something really cool, right? It doesn't matter how cool technology you have or what type of patents you have. It's still a challenge to go to market and establish partnership, receive grants, convince investors. So do you want to talk about your early stage challenges to even take the company at the current stage? Yeah, sure. So I always had a bit of that, that entrepreneurial bug. I remember in doing my, my undergrad at the university in, in business, I always like wanted to be involved with a, a new business, a startup of some kind, but I didn't have any good ideas myself, right? I, I didn't have anything that came to mind, as I mentioned. But before it was actually my, my friend and, and fellow co-founder, Braden, who had randomly met this inventor of the product. And knowing that I had such a strong interest in starting a business, both of us were so interested in trying to work together and figure out how we could develop this and, and turn it into an actual business. So that's kind of really how things started. And then the, the process from there played out really over a number of years because from first point of meeting the inventor to 
getting those granted patents to getting that first research complete at a more in-depth scale, getting that first research published. All that takes a considerable amount of time. And you have to really work on not getting too impatient at the speed of a lot of these, these things. Right. And it comes back to just having your eyes set on the future and knowing you're in this sector that's just beginning and you have a product that actually works and, and can make a difference in the world. And, you know, for us, those, those first few years, we're really trying to establish a bit of credibility and reputation for the product, which came in the, con you know, through granted patents and published research. Those are two big pieces, but then it started to transition to, okay, well, what, what is the actual business behind this? How do we start now building that business infrastructure, which is, you know, an equally important piece, but very different than trying to establish some of that, you know, scientific credibility. Right. And so after, you know, years of trying to work through some very early stage prototypes, getting more of this research underway. We had the opportunity to bring on some, some early stage angel investment and that helped really formalize things for us. And, you know, kind of true formation of the company and actually gave us the ability to, to take action and work with potential uh, partners because, you know, you can only do so much when you're, when you're bootstrapping and right. putting in time, you know, outside of full-time job that you might have just trying to support yourself. And I think one of the things I've learned is just how much time is required to work on the business. And early on, I, I just, I would have vastly underestimated how much work it would be. So I kind of look back and I think being a naive, excited entrepreneur is good at the beginning, because right. if you knew how much work it would be, how things would go wrong, how nothing works out, just the way you planned, you'd never start anything, right? So there's kind of this, you know, you get it, you're smiling, you, you understand, like, it's just, there's so many pieces, it's so complicated, there's so much working against you all the time, that you do need to be just, I say, naive at the beginning, if you want to kind of make it through. Right. So, you know, there was, of course, that playing and it probably still plays a role. Am I going to look back in a few years and think, boy, I thought we had a lot figured out back in 2021. Well, I was probably wrong and I will be wrong. Just trying to put together a, a product like ours that's never been, it's never been made before, right? Like we know we have these blocks of salt for animals, but integrating salt that you touch on a daily basis, has just never been done. So of course, that in itself has presented a huge challenge because you're trying to build something that's never been built and then bring it to market in a market that, you know, until a couple of years ago, didn't even exist. Yeah, yeah. So it, you have these, just these huge challenges and taking a long-term mindset is going to help you. And knowing that you're going to need to work with others, right? Like, this product, this challenge, what we're trying to build with Outbreaker is so much bigger than like one person. You need skills and, and, and specialization from folks, science, legal, regulatory, business. And that's just to now, right? And we still need to get that approval done. We still need to launch. And we have, you know, a bunch of different possibilities that we want to attack. So it all about keeping your mind focused on the future, because um, if you don't have that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be tough. Right. So like, what would you say was the biggest challenge until now and starting scaling the company to the current stage? For us, there was this period that I look back on now, a few years ago, where we lacked, we lacked a, a coherent vision for what the company could be. And the challenge with that, of course, if it's, if it's not evident, if you lack a specific vision, but it's when it comes to actually allocating your time and then allocating resources through like actual money, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up burning through all your cash and you're no further along in actually advancing the business. So there's this period a few years ago where we had all these possibilities, but we didn't know, okay, well, let's focus here which will give us some information and help inform what comes next and build out that plan that then of course creates this vision for where you want to go. And that, I just look back and I remember that being, you know, probably the most uncomfortable period because you weren't sure uh, exactly what to do. You weren't sure where to spend your time. Should we, should we buy this? It's like, okay, this is a $10,000 decision. Oh, wow. 
the first time you hit a, you know, a thousand dollar decision, a $10,000 decision, those can be stressful times when you're hitting them for the first time. So, and then of course, if you lack that vision and you don't have a plan, you're not sure, it's just, you can't in that state bring on partners, right? You can't bring on investors. You need to figure that out. So I look back at that time and really trying to figure out, okay, what is this product? What can it be? And then, okay, now that we know what it can be, what do we need to actually start putting it together? And it can't happen all at once, right? So it's like, okay, there's going to be three steps, right? And then we know we can start to move. So just just put that time in and it, it can hopefully pay off for you. Well, it resonates with me quite a bit because uh, as an entrepreneur, by nature, you're overexcited, right? Yeah. You want to do all of that. You see the potential and you want to jump in. But one thing that you have to learn as an entrepreneur is you have to pick a few things and really focus, right? Because uh, you have limited times, you have limited money, but limited resources. So you really have to pick the most lucrative thing and then scale from there. So yeah, it resonates with uh, me and I'm sure with most uh, entrepreneurs, like the most, the biggest challenge is how to find that sweet spot and stick with it, do it really right. Yeah. Uh, instead of doing 10 things and uh, moving nowhere, right? And, you know, listening to the feedback you get from pretty much everyone you talk to is really important. Mm-hmm. And I just, I also, you know, looking backwards for the longest time, I just didn't know what to do with right. feedback and criticism because right. right on one hand, like you say, you're so excited that you don't want to listen to somebody who's criticizing. Right, right. So it takes, you just need to mature a little bit to say, okay, I understand what they're saying. Okay, what can we do now to, 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 to fix that, resolve that, make, make that improvement? Because, you know, anybody who's talking to you who's in the position of being able to write you a check, their feedback matters, right? But that's a customer, investor, partner. Um, right. You need to listen to that and, and take it. Somebody can critique you and that critique might not be valid, but then you have to ask yourself, well, there's clearly a perception issue here, right? right. And right. it's like, okay, did I not explain that correctly, right? Am I, is our entire communications strategy not working? And right. so just, again, one of these things that takes time, you need a ton of data points over, right. yeah. over years to start to get better at that. But, you know, listen, yeah, figure out, listen to that feedback and figure out how it, how it can impact you. No, good point. Would you say there was any impact of COVID like how you are uh, running business, how you prioritize your future goals? Like what was the main impact of COVID in your whole journey? So uh, COVID certainly has been uh, for our business, a, a, uh, it, it's helped us, right? And, and largely because prior to COVID, the majority of the public didn't ever think about picking up an infection. Right, right. right. Governments, businesses, you know, outside of hospitals, not very many places were focused on that. So just the general public understanding of infections, how easily it can be to, to pick up uh, something, uh, even though COVID is respiratory virus, that's not typically what, you know, our product's going after. It's helped generally inform the public and decision makers within, you know, these different, like a, a school, a, a commercial office building, like all these places now have preventing infections as part of what they have to think about. So that just in terms of the public's, you know, uh, realization and understanding of just how big this problem is, that wouldn't have happened, right, without a global pandemic. So there's that. And then also, you know, early on for us last year, winning uh, an actual grant from Roche, right, like that wouldn't have happened, you know, without COVID, right, Roche put together uh, a series of grants for companies to develop new technologies. Uh, so we've certainly been able to benefit from, from those factors. And, you know, looking back, we still have a bit of an uphill battle with, with trying to convince certain segments of just how important these types of products are. But COVID certainly, certainly helped that. We weren't, we weren't negatively impacted uh, by it, just, you know, as an early stage company, but also what COVID represents is part of the exact, you know, issue that, that we're after. Good point. COVID basically made people aware of uh, all the essential things, right? You have to protect yourself from unnecessary contamination, unnecessary infection. 
I want to learn more about your thoughts and your experience in the local Alberta biotech community because Alberta is known for oil and gas, right? And ag agriculture too. And I know recently government has been focusing on more bioeconomy and there are local support groups like Bio Alberta and other trade associations, event organizers, we, uh, groups. So what is your experience as a biotech company in Alberta and, and what insights you can share about the local biotech ecosystem? Well, it's just in the last few years has grown considerably, right? So the space we're in now as a company, the University of Alberta's Health Accelerator, didn't exist prior to late 2018. Mm -hmm. And it's full of companies now, uh, a lot of them spin-offs of the University of Alberta. And really what that showcases is just how much, you know, really novel research, which can be built into these novel technologies are coming out of like these academic centers. And because the nature of the research that's required to generate novel solutions within this space, a university is a pretty critical piece of the puzzle here. Just the, the barriers, just when it comes to peer infrastructure and actually exploring things, pretty much for most things have to happen with the support of a university. So seeing the university make some investments in this with that accelerator space and, and trying to focus on the commercialization piece, uh -huh. uh, that's been a big difference from early days, even when we first met the inventor and had those very first conversations. Edmonton didn't have a life sciences space, right? Mm -hmm. There was no group of biotech companies that you could easily identify in Edmonton. And then a few years later, here we are, you know, we're part of this, this group that's coming through with some really exciting companies, like fellow companies in the space doing really amazing things. So I think it's a function of having a really good university right? We're in Edmonton. Calgary is the same, right? Like some really cool research that's coming out and then seeing more collaboration between health research, but also engineering, right? right. And that crossover is also really cool. Although our product doesn't have a digital piece to it, so much does. And that's where, again, you're seeing that this, these crossover and the overlap between uh, medical research and engineering. So it's really cool. I, I'm much more optimistic than I was a few years ago just seeing the investment that comes into the space, both from, you know, I've grown, born in Alberta, grown up in Alberta. So I, of course, I, and I grew up in rural Alberta where oil and gas was king. So, you know, I'm, I'm well aware of just how the province has changed on that front. I, I'm curious, I mean, you, I know we were just talking before, you've been in many parts of the world, you know, what is your take on seeing Alberta's, you know, new and growing life sciences space? Right, I can totally see the strong support system. Like from government, there are many grants, how they are empowering uh, academic research. It also supported by government grants, right? And then local support groups like Bio Alberta, how involved they are, how like proactively they are connecting different uh, players with each other. So I'm very impressed by how proactively the whole uh, community is working to uh, make this province more compatible for bioeconomy. Because bioeconomy, it's a potentially a multi-trillion dollar industry, right? So you need this proactive behavior and uh, local support groups to uh, help create new entrepreneurs, to help people yeah. uh, commercialize their invention. Because if technology is just an academic lab, uh, it's of no use, right? But to improve the human life, you have to help uh, nurture these entrepreneurs and help them commercialize these technology. And I think Alberta is doing an amazing job. Yeah, and we've certainly been able to benefit from some of those government support for, for that really early stage stuff, which is an important piece. I think the next, the next big piece that I think is going to help the ecosystem is a broader understanding of biotech and life sciences within some of the private investment community. You know, it, it, because it's relatively new, there's not a giant list of biotech investors in Alberta, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's not, a, at least now, publicly, isn't a very long list. Yeah. Um, so as more companies become well-known, as we're able to grow and start to develop and actually scale up, hopefully that list of investors will grow. Because, you know, I guess right now, the area I'm, I'm really keeping an eye on is 
you, you're just starting out in the university or you just have a new technology, you're able to leverage a few government grants to kind of get that research and that first prototype done. But then, right, valley of death, that gap before you can really start to scale, that's going to be the key thing, I think, for Alberta. That'll be what I want to keep an eye on. Wonderful. So Matt, it was really fun to talk to you. And I learned a lot and how it's really impressive how you're creating this uh, really simple, natural uh, product to potentially save millions of lives. So it's really impressive uh, what you're doing. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I'll talk to you soon. Hey, thanks so much, Guru. Really had, really had fun. Thank you, Matt. Bye.